Hello and welcome to Eplubishum's 5 Side Chats. Not as good as FDR's, but hey, it's something. Now, y you may notice my voice, or maybe you don't, but I'm a little under the weather, so that's why I'm going to be doing, for this particular podcast, I mean, okay, but check out, before I get into the video itself, why don't you go check out my interview with Hector Osegura. You know, I think it was a good interview. With all that out of the way, let's get right into the news. The first thing is I'm not going to be talking about impeachment. Because uh, I, mean, I don't think it's worthy until it officially dies. So we're going to wait for that. But the thing that I will talk about that is something that people have been... Hammering about for the past whatevers. The UK has left the EU and the implications for the world are huge. Brexit has happened. After 1,316 days of political turmoil, the UK now stands alone as the first nation to have ever left the European Union. It has ended the careers of two prime ministers and left the very future of the United Kingdom in question. Scotland's case for independence is becoming harder to ignore, while Britain's perceived selling out of Northern Ireland has played into the hands of those wishing to see Irish unification. That's just the politics. Britain's economic future and place in the world have not been under this uncertain since the end of World War II. So, yeah. Brexit is happening. I mean, it has happened. Brexit is done. We will not... Talking about Brexit anymore. Brexit is done. The only reason that Jeremy Corbyn lost is just finished now. So hypothetically, Corbyn would be able to run again. But, you know, Corbyn's saying, nah, I'm not going to run again. I'm just going to stay an MP, not a PM. That's going to be up to someone else. And I might do a video talking about the labor election, but I don't know when that is. I don't know. So, I'm probably not going to do that, but... Okay, so, I'm going to move on to the next story, which is fun, I guess. Mother of success kid demands Steve King stop using his meme. She fears the copyrighted photo of her son, now 13, will be associated with the bigotry of Representative King, an Iowa representative who has used it in a campaign fundraising ad. Now, for those who don't know what this is, because this is... An old meme. Do you remember that picture of a little kid that like has that is like grabbing sand and he looks determined? Yeah, well that meme is called Success Kid, and apparently Steve King has used it in an ad. And the mother is mad. <sighs> she is demanding Steve King don't use that meme anymore. Cause she owns the copyright to that meme, I guess. The reason is because, mommy, I mean, the reason is kind of obvious. She doesn't want her son to become the next Pepe. Now, for those who don't know what Pepe is, where have you been the past three years? Well, four years, technically. No. Yeah, probably just three years. So, Pepe the Frog, for those who don't know, is a popular internet meme of a little frog who's happy. The alt-right, like, people started using him in racist ways, you know, because every meme is going to be used in a racist way at one point or another. And then, the Anti-Defamation League literally said that Pepe became a hate symbol. Like, they made the entirety of Pepe a hate symbol. Which then led to more people to use Pepe in racist ways. And Pepe has officially become a literal symbol of the political alt-right. What? Like, seriously? You... Seriously? You allowed the alt-right to use a stupid, silly frog... Like, seriously, there was no reason that they, like, I mean, and the Anti-Defamation League changed their mind now. Now they put a little 
blurb that says, We only talk about Pepe's in racist ways. Those are the bad Pepe's. Not all, the entirety of Pepe. It's like, yeah, no shit, duh. That's the point. That's the joke. You you can't disagree with the joke. But that's the joke. The joke is supposed to be like, Haha, it's funny because Pepe is wearing a clan outfit. That's funny, right? That's the joke. Like, it's the reason why other symbols are just like, if you let them use the symbol, they will take it. Like, now doing the okay symbol is considered white supremacist. Milk is white supremacist. Um... It's another white supremacist thing. The clown emoji is white supremacist, apparently. I don't know what... Like, I mean... What is, there's another white supremacist one. Oh, yeah, there's, like, a bunch of, like, ancient letters that are white supremacist now. It's like, what? This is so confusing. This is so stupid. I mean, to be fair, white supremacists have always been stupid. I mean, they're the ones who... In order to counteract people knowing who they are, I decided to wear stupid ghost costumes. Like, seriously. If the KKK was founded today, nobody would care. The only reason people are afraid of the KKK is because the KKK has killed people. That is why people are afraid of the KKK. If they didn't kill people and were just founded today, nobody would care. They'd be like, haha, the stupid white supremacist with silly ghost costumes. Like, seriously, there's morbidly obese people who wear clan outfits. That's not scary. A morbidly obese clansman is not scary. Just throw a cheeseburger in the opposite direction and he'll run after that and not you. But seriously, like, I don't get why people are just... It's a meme, that's the thing. They're gonna use it. Everybody's gonna use a meme... That is the literal point of a meme. That everybody uses it. It gets transferred from person to person. The meaning changes every so often. You're never going... And, and, and I think this is going to backfire on the mom. Because now the success kid meme will be used rapidly by, like, everybody. I mean, seriously, it, it's going to be used one way or another. Now I'm pretty sure White Supremacist might just get the okay to use it. Okay, so, next story. Trump unveils his Middle East plan amid Palestinian rejections. United States President Donald Trump unveiled his long-delayed Middle East plan on Tuesday, a proposal the Palestinian leader called a conspiracy that will not pass. Today, Israel has taken a giant step towards peace. Trump said as Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu stood by his side. My vision presents a win-win solution for both sides, he said, adding that Israeli leaders have said that they will endorse the proposal. Before the proposal was announced, Palestinians called it dead on arrival, saying that it was an attempt to finish off the Palestinian cause. And they've stated a thousand no's. So yeah, I haven't read the entirety of the plan, but here's what it says. It says Israeli sovereignty over major illegal settlement blocks in the occupied West Bank. And Jerusalem will remain Israel's undivided capital. And there'd be some sort of eastern Jerusalem that he doesn't elaborate on. That would serve as the capital of Palestine. No, it says right here, he later said on Twitter that the Palestinian capital could be in parts of East Jerusalem. And apparently, and, and the thing is, they don't even allow travel between the two areas. There's one part of the plan where he literally shows, like, the only way for Palestinians to get from the, from the small part of the Gaza Strip that they have to the West Bank under this plan is to go underground. Like, he has to go in, they have to go in an underground tunnel. They can't even travel through Israel to go do it. And I mean, this is st stupid. And I mean, the thing is, like, Trump unveiled his plan. Like, many people have noticed this. Trump was there when he unveiled his plan. Netanyahu was there when he unveiled his plan. Guess who wasn't there? Leader of Palestine. Because he didn't get a say in the plan at all. 
the Palestinians have never gotten a say in any of the plans to divide Israel. Even the most fair plan that they could have possibly given, the 1947 partition plan, Palestinians didn't get a say on the matter. Literally, here's what happened. UN made the plan and said, Hey, Palestine, we're gonna drop a we're gonna drop a bunch of Jews in here. Is that okay? Good. And I mean, Palestinians were like, no, thank you. We don't want that. Get that out of here. This is our land. And then Israelis formed a government anyways. Then Palestinians were going to fight back because, I mean, a bunch of people just invaded their land and declared their own country. I mean, it's, this sounds Trumpian, but I mean, if if you were the president of the United States and then some people from, like, China just flew in and then, like, took over Delaware... Or not even Delaware, like, took over, like, like, I mean, like, took, took over the equivalent of, like, Texas and California put together. Wouldn't that be a bit, like, huh? Excuse me? You'd be confused. Then UN British troops were like, hey, we're gonna make sure that we can preserve this plan. And then Palestinian and the Arab League were like, no, and then they fought, and then... It was grayer when the conflict began, but now it's not gray anymore. It's clearly, even if it's slightly gray, it's like incredibly light gray because Israeli is. Like, the is like Israel is the one that is causing a lot of the problems. If I were part, if I were part of the U.S. like government and was like negotiating a Palestinian plan, I would have tried to get like the some form of the 1947 partition plan because that's the most fair way to divide the land they divide it 55 percent to israel and 45 percent to palestine like i mean and i know you might say that's not entirely fair yeah but it's the most fair that they're gonna get israel's not gonna go 50 50 and they're not gonna get small or we'd at least negotiate like stop the killing please so anyways speaking of palestinians the next story Tlaib promises to preserve party unity and after wading into Clinton Sanders row. So basically, here's what happened. During a Bernie Sanders rally, Rashida Tlaib, Pramila Jayapal, and uh, Ilhan Omar were like at a meeting. And then at one per- per- point, someone mentioned Hillary Clinton. And then some people on were kind of like, boo. And he's like, and then the woman's like, no, 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 no booing. But then Rashida Tlaib is like, no, I'll boo. Boo. And then she's like, yeah, I'll, I'll boo. In, if, due to the fact that, you know, Hillary Clinton's been making some remarks that are like, mm, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do that. You're, you're a bad person, Bernie. You're a Russian asset, blah, blah, blah. And now Rashida's kind of backing away, saying like, yeah, I, I just kind of let the moment get to me. And it's like, no, Rashida, this is why we love you. You, you let the moment get to you. And you should be 100% justified. Because she is the one who helped rig the game against your candidate last time. And couldn't beat this shitty TV show star. Like, I mean, seriously. Like, I mean, the thing is, of course, you know, people, normal people are, like, happy. Kind of like, yeah, this is completely justified but of course Nira Tannen has to be stupid again because I don't know I guess she sold her brain somewhere I don't know this is her reply to this what I love about incidents like this the booing of Hillary at a Sanders rally is example after example of white male rage and misogyny Because the Palestinian woman of color, who is Muslim, is apparently a white cis male who is misogynist. There's a reason why this woman has so much money and power. She's just thinking with her head. Like, she puts Einstein to, like, shame. Einstein, Stephen Hawking, sorry, Neil deGrasse Tyson... You guys are just fucking morons. Nira Tannen, she's got the big brain, big brain time. 
No, like, seriously, I don't get why Nier Tannen is... Like, the only reason Nier Tannen exists is just to shill over the political... Like, she's uh, an establishment shill, obviously. But, of course, she's gonna be like, No, but cis white male Bernie Bros. Ooh, so scary. Ooh, ooh, a white, a white man in a Bernie hat. He said a bad word. Oh, no. I better cry in my money hole. Like, Nira, they have no power over you. Like, even if... Ugh, like, there is no even if. Because this is just stupid. This is not a real issue. She, for some reason, thinks that... Look at me. There are women, like, who... They get booed at a Bernie Sanders rally, and then they're like, I feared for my life. Oh, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? What are these ravenous animals going to do to you? These, like, bloodthirsty monsters. They're, they're human beings. They're not going to hurt you. Like, seriously, Barbara Boxer, Near Tannen, they're not going to hurt you. I wouldn't, like, if I saw them in real life, I'm not going to hit them. They're, they're, they're just paranoid. Because this is the only way they can characterize any person who thinks rationally. Like, I don't get it. And I mean, Near Tannen, she of course also loves like false equivalencies and such. Like when, <laughs> like when someone said like, hey, like, like I mean, I remember the whole UK thing. It was just so stupid. One day she's like, I, like, Jeremy Corbyn is a huge, terrible anti-Semite. I don't see why people would support him. And then people call her out, like, no, we should probably vote Labour. And she's like, oh, you're advocating for voting for a major party now, but in 2016, you were advocating for Jill Stein. See hypocrisy much? Like, and, like, I don't, like, well, this is, just, like, y you see how I'm just, like, stuttering, because, like, I can't understand the process because they are different like there's ideological reasons like the reason people voted for Bernie then Jill Stein and also advocated for voting for Jeremy Corbyn is shock all shocks because those three align ideologically and the reason why you're advocating for people to go vote for uh, Joe Swinson of Liberal Democrats and Hillary Clinton is not special or anything. It's because they have ideological similarities. And then, like, the day after Corbyn lost, she's like, why did he lose? The reason why he lost is this big anti-left campaign when she spent the last week literally shitting on him. Look at me, I... Yeah. I'm gonna move on because near Tannen, like, I don't even... In, in a real world, like, in a world that would make sense, Nier Tannen, Bakari Sellers, and all these big mainstream, like, corporate news people would be out on the streets begging for money because they do not contribute anything worth contributing. All their opinions and all their quote unquote facts or shit the next two stories are covering uh, our favorite buddies the DNC the DNC overhauls debate requirements opening door to Bloomberg the Democratic National Committee is drastically revising its criteria to participate in the debate primary in the primary debates after New Hampshire doubling the polling threshold and eliminating the individual donor requirement which could pave the way for former New York City Mayor Mike Bloomberg to make the stage beginning in mid-February. Candidates will need to earn at least 10% in four polls released from January 15th to February 18th, or 12% in two polls conducted in Nevada or South Carolina in order to participate in the February 19th debate in Las Vegas. Any candidate who earns at least one delegate in the National Convention in either Iowa caucuses or New Hampshire will also qualify for the Nevada debate. Okay, so... This is a big thing. And the same people are making the same arguments. Normal people are calling out the hypocrisy and 
flat out just BSing the DNC is making, while the moderate wing are going like, oh, this is great. I don't see why this, what's the problem. For those who don't know, let me explain their problems. The DNC said on way before the 2020 election that the rules were that the DNC would, n like, this is how the debates would go. You have to meet the donor criteria. You have to meet a certain donor criteria and a polling criteria. One of the two or two in the earlier debates. They set these rules on day one. And certain candidates, of course, did not meet this exact criteria. But when those candidates cried foul, they did not get their ideas heard. And when certain candidates did get, like Mike Bloomberg, he, of course, hasn't been making the donor criteria because he doesn't have a donor criteria. He doesn't accept donations. Which is which means he could see he could never make it into the debates. So literally, there's just no way he could make it on the debate stage. But the thing is, if he didn't have that criteria, he could make it on the debate stage. Which is why the DNCs are saying, okay, now we're going to remove the donor criteria. Despite the fact that the donor criteria is literally the more important criteria. If people are willing to give money to a candidate, it shows that they're willing to put their vote to that candidate. Like, that was the point of the donor criteria. It was their whole little stupid thing. Like... Oh, we, we can, of course, just ban big donors, but you have to make a certain amount of individual donors to show that we are the party of the people. And they can't control the donors, obviously. They can't control the polling. They can control how many polls get released. They can control what polls count and not. And they've done it before. They've done it to Tulsi. They've done it to Grell. They've done it to Andrew Yang. Like, and the thing is, people are like, Oh, I mean, this is this makes sense, but look, that this is serious. Steve Bullock, Mike Gravel, Tulsi Gabbard, Marianne Williamson, Michael Bennett, Cory Booker, Julian Castro, and Andrew Yang, all at one point or another, asked for the DNC to shift their rules. Steve Bullock said that he qualified for the first debate, so he should be led in the first debate. Mike Gravel said he met the donor threshold, so he should get in the, th the debate, but he did, but they were... Tulsi Gabbard, she said that she met the polling criteria, but the DNC would not count the polls for her for some reason. Marianne Williamson said that the amount of polls that were being released were not count, were not good, that they should release more polls. Michael Bennett also stated that people should consider more of the... Like, more polls should be released, and... The donor criteria should be counted a bit more. Cory Booker and Julian Castro said that the, do that the polling threshold was also being skewed against them. And Andrew Yang said so as well. But all of them, when they were talking about the like, polling threshold or whatever other issue, the DNC was like, sorry, we can't help you. The rules have been set. But Bloomberg, now he gets to have his voice heard on the debate stage. Because we didn't have enough billionaires on the debate stage. We needed more. This is just stupid. But the bigger stupid is this. DNC members discuss rules changed to stop Sanders at the convention. A small group of Democratic National Committee members have privately begun gouging support for a plan that could potentially weaken Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign and head off a Booker convention. In conversations on the sidelines of a DNC executive committee meeting, in telephone calls and texts in recent days, about half a dozen members have discussed the possibility of a policy reversal to ensure that so-called superdelegates can vote on the first ballot in the party's first national convention. Such a move would increase the influence of DNC members, members of Congress, and other top party officials who now must wait until the second ballot to have their say in the, con in the, con in the convention is contested. 
You have learned jack shit. You have learned jack shit. If the DNC pulls this shit again, this is even worse than 2016. Because in 2016, that was just the rules. In 2020, they're literally changing the rules halfway through the race. This is the equivalent of me playing chess with you. Then all of a sudden, I say, Oh no, no, you, you can't move your piece like that anymore. All your pieces can only move one space at a time. You're like, wait, that hasn't been the case before. But I'm like, yeah, but, you know, you're close to winning, so... I mean, I have to stop you somehow. Like, seriously. Seriously. This is bullshit. Like, this is stupid. And for some reason, some people are just going along with this. When there's literally no reason to. The superdelegates don't help the party. They hurt the party. They made people lose faith in the Democratic Party. There's a reason why... There's a reason why Movement for People's Party exists. There's a reason why the Green Party has gotten a big amount of members in recent years. It's because the Democratic Party is trying to pull... They pull stupid shit, even though they're called the Democratic Party. They're supposed to be the Democratic ones. But they literally are just not. They're not Democratic at all. Like, I mean, this is not democratic at all. And if the super delegates happen again, like, I mean, there's probably, like, I mean, it's going to lead, it's obviously going to lead to President Trump again, then the Bernie will be blamed again for some reason. They're like, hmm, we tried the same strategy that worked in 2016, and we lost again. Hmm, I wonder why we lost. <sighs> it's just so stupid. <laughs> Anyways, to add a little bit of sad levity, John Delaney drops out of presidential race. Former Maryland U.S. Rep. John Delaney has dropped his bid for the Democratic nomination for president. Delaney made the announcement Friday. It has been a privilege to campaign for the Democratic nomination for president, but it is clear that God has a different purpose for me at this moment in time. Wait, you could... Is he trying to kill himself? Like, I mean, whatever. S to be honest, I'm not as happy as other people are. Like, a lot of other people are like, yeah, hashtag dropout Dylan, he succeeded, hooray, yeah, yeah. But it's like, mm, I'm not, I'm not really too pleased with that. I mean, I honestly wanted John Dylan to stay around. <laughs> I thought that it would have been interesting to see John Delaney's campaign go through to the end. I mean, he was the first candidate to announce a candidacy for president in 20... Like, he announced in, like, 2017 that he was running for president. <laughs> That's interesting. I think that it is decently cool. Like, I mean, I, mean, I know, of course, he's not a cool person... But, I mean, it's interesting. But, I mean, again, yeah, I guess I see why. He hasn't been in a debate in a million years. His campaign has gotten literally nowhere. So, yeah, it's literally not at all surprising that he has dropped that at all. So, yeah, farewell, John Delaney. Your campaign has... At least it does better than Deval Patrick's. Now let's move on to the small candidate of the day, Jason Kishore of the Socialist Equality Party. Socialist Equality Party has is a far left socialist political party. Joseph Kishore is their candidate for president, who has like he became politically radicalized by Clinton administration's war against the war on Syria Serbia. He is the National Secretary of the SCP who, for since 2008, he has written for the past two decades hundreds of web, on hundreds of websites, including the likes of World Socialist website. And I mean, his VP is Narissa Santa Cruz. And 
they they and they're basically focusing the campaign on like you know the average social stuff like alongside you know immigration and such so anyways now let's move on to the main topic of this video joe rogan now i did at one point contemplate doing michael moore because michael moore was trending on twitter at the time but i feel like and eh, joe rogan's probably better now for those who don't know who joe rogan is let me explain a little bit about who he is. Joe Rogan. Now, while the older people in the audience might know Joe Rogan for Fear Factor or for being a wrestling commentator, everyone else, who is normal, recognizes him for the Joe Rogan podcast. What's the Joe Rogan podcast? Well, I mean, it's called the Joe Rogan Experience, but we just call it the Joe Rogan podcast. Or just Joe Rogan. You know, we just say, oh, it's Joe Rogan. <laughs> Joe Rogan, he has done... Look, like, his podcast is literally... Like, I mean, it's, it's just a conversation. Like, he just has a conversation with someone. Like, I mean, he's done conversations with Bill Burr, Kevin Smith, Eric Weinstein... Roseanne Barr, Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson, Edward Snowden, Jamie Foxx, Jesse Ventura, Bernie Sanders, Andrew Yang, Tulsi Gabbard, Richard Dawkins, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Lawrence Krauss, Roger Penrose, Mel Gibson, who's another one? Russell Brand. One of his older episodes, he talks with Cenk Uger. He talks with Jimmy Dore and Cal Kalinske a couple times. His show is not explicitly a political show, but he does decently, like he does do, he, he does talk a decent amount of politics. Joe Rogan, his political views have kind of been a bit of a mixed, weird thing. Now first, you might just want to know, who, like, do, do I like the show? Eh, it really depends on the guest. Like, I mean, I used to be subscribed to Joe Rogan for a bit, but I unsubscribed because he kept posting MMA shows, and I'm like, I don't care about the MMA. I don't care about mixed martial arts at all. And it really depends on the guest in which he does a show. Like, I mean, some of the guests are good, some of the guests are pretty bad. Like, I mean, there's Kyle Kalinske and Jimmy Dore. Their shows are usually good. Uh... Joey Diaz, he's a really good recurring guest, even though it's not explicitly political. But, I mean, he's just funny. I usually only watch the show whenever there's, like, a good political guest. You know, like, someone controversial like Ben Shapiro or... I don't know. Um, yeah, like Ben Shapiro or, like, Jordan Peterson or Candace Owens when they do something stupid, Joe Rogan calls them out. Or when there was, like, Penn Gillette when he was on an episode. I liked him on the show. Or when there's just a really interesting random guest. Like, for, like I didn't know, like, like just randomly, it's just like, oh, he talked to Edward Snowden? Seriously? And, I mean, his second and most recent episode, as of the time of this coming out, he did a podcast with Daryl Davis. For those who don't know who Daryl Davis is, he's a... African-American jazz musician who has converted over 200 KKK members to not be KKK members anymore. I mean, it's interesting. The, the show was interesting. I didn't... Then There was one thing that he said I didn't expect. I was like, oh, okay. And I mean, the thing is, is like, for some reason, like, Joe Rogan, like, like he's a, since he's a B-list celebrity... He, he he can say a lot more than most other celebrities can say. I mean, he's talked about, like... He's, like, of course he's done, like, Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself stuff. And it's like, mm, if you were a higher-ranked celebrity, you wouldn't, no, you'd be, you wouldn't be allowed to say that. But, I mean, he's he's done some really good shows. But, of course... The thing about him is the politics. This is a politics-oriented channel, so obviously politics is going to be the focus of this and why he's here. 
So Joe Rogan's politics has kind of been interesting. Joe Rogan, he has... Okay, so let me start out with this. Like, currently, he is a... Guest, I guess he's a he's a Bernie Sanders supporter for this election. At least that's what he said in one of his more recent podcasts. He said, I think I might vote for Bernie. Even though a little bit ago he said that he was going to vote for Tulsa Gabbard. He also expressed support for Andrew Yang and UBI. But of course, but it doesn't seem like he's going to be voting for Andrew Yang. It seems like he's going to be voting for Bernie. That led to some issues because... Joe Rogan has said some, like I said, controversial things. Or, I mean, things that you might think are not controversial, but just are. But, like, the thing that got him in trouble was the fact that Joe Rogan has said some things about transgender athletes. And some things about transgender people in general. He said some things about transgender people in general that are just like, huh? Like, it, it's clear he doesn't entirely understand transgender people. But, I mean, he's an older gentleman, so it's like, eh, that's somewhat fair. Like, he doesn't quite get them, but he doesn't disparage them. He's just like, eh, I mean, yeah, if, if, you, if you feel good about being transgender, be transgender. But the thing where he 100% draws the line, which is a place that he holds closer to his heart, is when transgender athletes compete in, you know, like, athletic sports for their preferred gender, particularly when male to female transgenders compete in female athletic sports. He is just a no-no on that, or at least as far as you can tell, he's a no-no for a certain time period. I don't know if he has like a cutoff date, but I mean, he expresses like mm, doubt and skepticism or just flat out disapproval whenever... He talks about it. And I mean, there's definitely a little bit of a gray area in some aspects of it. The South, the South Park episode that talked about it explains that there are definitely some gray areas to it. But inevitably, the thing is, I don't, get, I don't care. I'm not an athlete. I don't care about athletics. And I mean, I really just do not care about this debate. It's not a politically big issue. And inevitably, yeah, I, I just don't care about this issue. Transgender people, if they want to compete in these athletic events, so be it. I don't care. But Joe Rogan, he, he has a little bit of a... Mm, but I mean, otherwise, he doesn't explicitly... I mean, his other political views are, of course, rather lefty in some aspects. He stated how he wants universal health care. He stated how he wants, like, he stated, like, oh, legalized marijuana. He wants, like, he he's basically stated, like, you know, some lefty things, some things that are not so lefty. But his controversy also comes from the fact that he's talking to people like Ben Shapiro or Miley, Milo Yiannopoulos or Dave Rubin or Candace Owens. Like, people that are considered nonos. And he's part of this thing called the Intellectual Dark Web, which is a group of, like, right-wing people, or people who are trying to, like, be edgy and cool that have, like, Eric Weinstein and Joe Rogan. Like, Joe Rogan and, like, Eric Weinstein and, like, Dave Rubin and, like, Ben Shapiro and, like, these... Most of these guys are just complete goofs. But, I mean, out of all of them, Joe Rogan seems the most reasonable. I don't know about Eric Weinstein. Apparently, he's a lefty, but I'm just like, I don't really see that. He always seems to just be like, yeah, I like uh, you, Dave. You're cool. Like, I mean, it's like Dave Rubin. He always says, like, hey, why, I, why are you lefties? Come on my show. I mean, no, he doesn't say that. People are like, why don't you have lefties on the show? And you're like, um, Eric Weinstein, duh. And it's like, uh, whatever. But, I mean... Joe Rogan, it doesn't seem like he was always lefty. I mean, in the previous election, he endorsed Gary Johnson. And, you know, Gary Johnson is not a lefty. Gary Johnson is a libertarian. 
and Joe Rogan said in a more recent interview that, oh, I endorsed Gary Johnson because he did my podcast. And it's like, mm, I don't, I don't think so. What do you mean? Because we, we can, let's, let's analyze. Who did he endorse in the 2012 election? He publicly endorsed Ron Paul's candidacy for president. So, yeah. Brogan seems to come from a more libertarian standing. And it can be emphasized by the fact that in 2018, he endorsed the candidacy of Larry Sharp for the governor of New York, who is also a libertarian. So, of course, Joe Rogan has a bit of a libertarian tendency. Fine. I have a bit of a libertarian tendency, too. Mostly on, like, social issues... But I mean, it's it's fine. It, he can be whatever political ideology he wants. But there is another political endorsement that is definitely like, huh? But it's like way back. It's not even like it's it's weird. But I think it's just at least worth mentioning, at least to show his political evolution. Apparently, in two thousand six, he endorsed the candidacy of Brian Barton for California District fifty three in the Republican nomination. Brian Parton is a huge, like, he's a member, he was a member of the Minuteman Project, which is a group of, like, far-right, like, guys who would who would be, like, a right-wing militia to, like, guard the border from any Mexicans entering. And it's, like, it definitely at least shows that Joe Rogan's at least evolved on his political issues, at least on some of them. Some of the things he's, of course, just seem like, just cool with from the beginning like like he's like I was supposed to support a gay marriage when I was like 11 and it's like yeah I guess that makes sense but but I mean Joe does have some I guess problematic things but I mean not really he said some things that are just like eh of course he might say some controversial things like saying Epstein didn't kill himself Because that's controversial, apparently. Or that Hillary Clinton may have had a hand in Seth Rich. He said some things that are definitely like, "Mm hmm. But I mean, they use that as a way to diminish Bernie's campaign. And it's like, guys, Joe's not Bernie. Bernie's not Joe. They're two separate people. The reason, and I mean, technically, isn't this a good thing? Leave me if Joe Rogan is the far-right, misogynist, transphobe that you think he is. I thought that was the people you were trying to bring. You were trying to bring people like that, like from the Republican Party, to vote for the Democrat. Isn't that what you wanted? Oh, no, no, no. You didn't want those ones. You wanted the big, rich Republicans. I mean, like, I mean, there is something where he said, like, Joe Rogan, it's just... The reason why is because he sees, says things that just kind of, like, bother me a bit, like... Not even like that, but like, I just told you, like, he endorsed the candidacy of Ron Paul in 2012, but he just told Jimmy Dore, like, I've never voted Republican for president in my life. And I'm like, really? Like, I thought you, I thought you endorsed Ron Paul's candidacy. But I mean, again, if John Rogan evolved, that's good. Tulsi's evolved on some stuff. She used to be a huge homophobe. Now, she's not. But, I mean, yeah, people evolve. People change. And, I mean, unlike Candace Owens or Dave Rubin's change, Joe's seems legitimate because he is, like, like he didn't shift in, like, two seconds. Republican Minuteman, Libertarian, who has a bit of a Republican stint, Libertarian, Libertarian-like Democrat, Bernie, it was a gradual shift. Like, I mean, and Joe stayed like he was, like, in 2016, like, he was like, oh, Bernie, super far-left socialist guy who says, like, things should be free. It's like, uh. But then he's, like, he's like, when he actually hears the guy, he's like, oh, this makes just, just makes sense. And that's the point. If we just say this, this is normal people. If people can get that message to just random people, it'll work. People who, like, fear monger about Bernie being a communist or a socialist or whatever. 
if they just hear Bernie out, they're just like, oh yeah, that just makes sense. Bernie went to rural West Virginia, and then when he said, do you believe healthcare should be free? And then a rural West Virginian is like, absolutely. The message works. It's just a matter of getting that message out. And Joe can be the messenger. Like, you can't get rid of the Dick Cavett of the modern day and just say, no, we're not going to accept your endorsement. And you might say, come on, dude, isn't that, isn't saying he's the Dick Cavett of our modern day, like, a bit of a ego stroke? Guys, Dick Cavett held a show where he would bring people of many opposing ideologies and didn't care who he brought on, he invited an African-American football player to talk with a segregationist. He invited the first widely reported transgender person. He invited anti-war activist John Kerry to talk to a huge war advocate. Like, he doesn't, like, discriminate against who he brings on, and that's the same with Joe Rogan. He'll bring on, like, Ben Shapiro to talk to Cenk Uger and just talk, and they'll talk, and maybe they'll laugh or something. Joe needs to do that more. He needs to bring, like, two people of opposing political ideologies and just bring them on the show. Like, get Dave Rubin to talk to Kyle Kalinske again. So, anyways, that's pretty much all I gotta say about Joe Rogan because my voice is probably better to give out, so... Yeah, Joe Rogan, pretty good show... His political views are getting better. Just needs to get a little further. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report.